This is episode 17 of the You, Me, and BTC podcast. Welcome. Today, our chat begins with some thoughts on anonymity. We know that many people might not put much effort into preserving their privacy, but we'll explain why it's important and mention some tools that can make it easier. Later in the show, we'll try to determine what might be the best way to promote Bitcoin among average people. It's hard because average people, including ourselves, tend not to notice any faults in what they do or believe. Remember to visit our website, youmeandbtg.com, to find more episodes, articles, and donation addresses. We'd also encourage you to subscribe to the show if you haven't already. I'm Daniel Brown, and I'm joined today by Tim Baker. Here we go. Welcome, everybody, to episode 17 of the You, Me, and BTC podcast. We're excited to be here again. Today is April 22nd, and you'll be hearing this show in two days on Thursday, the 24th, at least for the first time. Hopefully, some people listen later. But anyway, we also, today for the first time, have a sponsor for our show. We are excited to have bitlasers.com as our first sponsor. We actually ordered a laser from them. They exclusively accept Bitcoin, and their lasers are not the red $10 lasers that you might find at Walmart or the flea market or wherever you get those things. I mean, those little red lasers are fun, but they are not bit lasers. (laughs) Actually, Tim was the one that ordered the laser and had a lot of fun with it, so I'll let you tell us about it just a little bit because we actually have a video review on our website, which you can check out, but tell us what it was like. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it was a lot different than anything I've ever been used to. Um, The only thing I've ever used is one of the cheap little red laser pointers, which I think the cheapest one they have on bit lasers is like a 40 or $50, and I think it's one of the red ones. Uh, I got the blue, I got the bit brew blue laser parts bundle, and it does come in a bundle because of shipping issues. I played with it a little bit, then last week uh, I met up with you and John and we messed with it a little bit. (laughs) I probably shouldn't say we messed with it because this really isn't something you want to mess with. If you're shining it inside, you can't look at it directly. Like If you're shining it against the wall or something, it's just going to be too bright. You have to look away and actually that's about all I've done so far is I'll point it and If you're in any kind of darkness, you can see the full beam, and I'll kind of just look out of the side of my eye, because if I try to look at it straight on, it's just so brilliant and bright that it starts to hurt, which definitely, if you're getting, especially any of the higher power lasers, definitely pick up the protection glasses for $9, because at first I was like, yeah, I don't don't know if I'm going to need that. It can't be that bright, and then (laughs) uh, I turned it on, and I couldn't see for a little bit. Once I get the goggles, maybe I'll try to figure out a way if I can actually just record the laser burning through the piece of paper. But in that video, I kind of show the aftermath of it just because I didn't want to sit and have to look at it for... I I wasn't sure how long it was going to take. It took about probably a little under a minute for it to burn through a normal piece of paper. But I I just kind of videoed it and showed what happened afterwards. Yeah, it is pretty awesome. We were messing with it the other day. Yeah, I guess not really messing with it, but... Carefully waving it around. (laughs) Exactly. But yeah, even outside, we were shining it at a leaf a couple feet away. And yeah, we couldn't look at where we were shining it because it was too bright. So yeah, be careful, but they are pretty awesome. So if you want to learn more, you can look at the video review on our website, or you can just go straight to bitlasers.com and see what all they have. When they do order, I think that there's a place where you can make like a special note on the order. Definitely let them know that uh, you heard about them here. Yeah, please. So yeah, check that out. But we are ready to move on. Today's episode, we are going to try to focus on sort of anonymity and privacy. I mean, we've mentioned these ideas before on the show because they're definitely important, but we wanted to try and focus quite a bit on them. 
The reason I kind of thought we should start talking about these things is mostly from the show we had a couple weeks ago with Dr. Jeffrey Herbner. He's an economics professor, and he gave a talk about bitcoins, uh, which was pretty interesting, and it was nice to have a voice that was kind of knowledgeable about economics and finance and everything. We think about it and talk about it all day long, but we're not experts by any means, and we're not educated specifically in that sort of field. So it was nice to have kind of an expert opinion. Even though we didn't completely agree, it was good to listen to. But one thing that he was saying that I kind of wanted to respond to, he wasn't completely wrong, but it's something worth talking about. Well, mostly it started with the taxes. The IRS now is taxing Bitcoin as property officially, and he was saying how that's going to drive a ton of people away because they don't want to worry about taxes, they don't want to worry about every time they spend Bitcoin, even if it's just on a cup of coffee, they have to think about how much capital gains they had and then how much they owe the government. And that's all technically true. And, in fact, a lot of people probably will be turned off by that and might completely ignore Bitcoin. And he mentioned how if you're technical enough and if you know what you're doing, you might be able to remain anonymous if you're careful and you keep an eye out and everything. And that's the important part, is he was saying that you can be anonymous, but most people probably aren't going to do that. And I think I agree with that, and that's why we need to talk about this. I actually tweeted a quote where he said something like, the average Joe Sixpack, he's not going to do all that work to remain anonymous. And so, yeah, we wanted to talk about how you can do that, kind of what you need to focus on to keep your privacy and remain anonymous. Now, I know even now this isn't going to affect everybody, and the solutions we give are by no means perfect. So I guess before we get into too much, I guess the reason that anonymity is connected to taxes is because, I mean, obviously, if you don't agree with taxes, if you don't think taxes are right, if you don't want to pay taxes, then you need to remain anonymous. For a lot of people, not everyone, definitely not everyone, but for a lot of people, that's a really important part of Bitcoin as a whole is it's a way to escape government control and government tyranny and things like that. And it's a way for them to control their own money and avoid penalties and fines and whatnot and taxes. But that only goes so far. And if you can't remain anonymous, which is kind of difficult on the Bitcoin network because the blockchain is public intentionally. Every single transaction is listed right there for everyone to see. Now, it's not necessarily associated with your person unless you do that publicly, but it is out there, all that information, and it can affect you and things like that. So if you're trying to avoid taxes, and I guess that generally, other than just people just kind of saying, oh, I don't want you to know what I'm doing with my money, other than just general kind of privacy, I think avoiding taxes would be one of the main reasons that we care about it, right? Is, is that true, or do you, is there any other reasons? Yeah, I mean, anonymously, just being able to send money to different places, whether those or different people, whether that's legal stuff, and you just don't want people to know that you're spending money there, or sending people money, or illegal things like the Silk Road or other things like that. But I think for a lot of people, just because a lot of people involved in Bitcoin are more of a libertarian bent, and quite a few of them are more the full, like what I would consider like real libertarian, the uh, market anarchist or anarcho-capitalist, where, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is not one to pay taxes, where, yeah, some of that is, okay, it's my money, and I don't feel like you should just be allowed to take my money, but part of it, too, is... I don't want my money being taken and used to murder people in other countries or to murder people here with the more and more how cops are just going off and killing people. This kind of reminds me, I kind of wrote a little bit of something way back. I don't know how much you heard about this, Daniel, but you hear about Scott Kelly at all? Nah, not at all. Scott Kelly was a homeless guy who was beaten to death, like literally beaten to death. He was knocked unconscious and taken to the hospital and died in the hospital either I think it was the next day he died there by two cops 
who called for backup and then had like six cops on top of this guy just because he wasn't complying with contradictory orders. And the only way I can say that it was that I'm willing to say that this is why is because, and this is why this was different from most things, was that this entire altercation was caught on a camera. You can hear the cops threatening him. You can see that he's not resisting. You can see all this stuff. And this happened a few years ago, but just a few months ago, both of those cops were let off without anything. And that pissed a lot of people off, and it pissed me off. And that that's like a lot of people's reaction. Oh, we got to go get those guys. We got to I'm like, well, I mean, that's not going to help anything. I don't think that just killing someone because they killed someone else really helps the person who was killed in the first place. They're already dead. But that did remind me of why I care so much about Bitcoin and why I get so annoyed when people are like, yeah, I, I welcome regulation into here. I welcome <laughs> taxation. I want to be, I'm like, you're the problem here. It's not the people who are trying to tax us. That's, yeah, they're bad, but we let them do this. And then we say, oh, I'm a good little citizen. I'm a, I'm so good because I pay my taxes and everybody tells me I'm good. And, Anyone who tries to avoid their taxes now, they're bad. They're a, what are they, cheating on your taxes there. Yeah, <laughs> cheating from being stolen from. But anyway, that's what got me. And I was like, this is exactly why I use this stuff is because so I don't have to pay tax. I don't have to pay this money to these psychopaths who think they should get to rule me and then hire these goons who beat people. And then we're like, oh, well we'll just take them to court that they work for and somehow the court's going to get us justice whenever they kill one of us. So anyway, that was my little rant thing about that. Yeah, it's true. There are definitely reasons like that. And yeah, it's not just tax issues, but anything that kind of goes against the government or if it's buying and selling illegal things or, I mean, it's kind of hard to say that because <laughs> as soon as you say, buying or selling illegal things, a whole bunch of people are going to be like, oh, you jerks, you guys are such bad people, or something like that, but there's a lot more to it than that, and uh, I mean, we, we, we talk about that quite a bit, so we don't need to describe what all is behind that, but in general, you know, Bitcoin just gives people the ability to do things, a lot more things, well, as long as they can make use of this available anonymity and i guess that's kind of what we need to get into but yeah that is definitely true that it gives people a lot of i don't know if i want to say power but it allows them to escape other people's power and that's important yeah i mean it because it, it just puts everyone on an equal playing field and i think we had talked about that before way 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 back probably like one of the first few episodes we were doing and I've heard a lot of people say that Bitcoin is democracy, and I'm like, no, not really. Bitcoin is just, okay, everyone can do whatever they want as long as you're following the rules that are kind of following the rules in the same way that everyone's allowed to walk around as long as they follow the rules of gravity. Because you can't really, you can't use Bitcoin if you're breaking it. <laughs> exactly. At the exactly. same time. Well, yeah, so I guess we can jump into some of these things we want to talk about then. One of the first things that I wanted to talk about that is pretty cool that I just noticed a couple of weeks ago, I don't know exactly when it was created or released, but inside the blockchain wallet, which is, even though web wallets are kind of risky and kind of dangerous, it's still one of the most popular wallets out there, blockchain.info, if anybody doesn't know that, even though I think most people would. They introduced their thing called Shared Coin, which I think it's almost identical to the coin join concept, except this Shared Coin is actually implemented and actually usable. I mean, there were ways to use coin join, but it was barely developed, and it was more of just a concept, and Shared Coin is kind of the implementation of that concept. But basically what happens is, Anybody who wants to make a transaction about the same time can kind of combine their money, put it all together, and then mix up all the outputs so that you can't tell whose money is going to who. It happens on a fairly large scale, but let's just say there was five or six people, 
and person one wanted to give 10 bucks to person number six. Well, if all six people get together and mix up their money, person one's money might actually go to person two, but the person who was supposed to pay person number two might end up paying person number six. I don't know if that's a good way of putting it. I might not be good at describing this kind of thing, but the point is the money gets mixed up and you can't tell who it's going to or who it's coming from. So you can't connect buyers and sellers or senders and receivers as directly as you can if there was just a normal single transaction from this address to this address. It's not that simple, and it mixes things up, and it adds anonymity. That's exactly what it is and what it does. It's pretty cool It's because you can see right on the blockchain, you can see all that confusion and all that mixture because... Again, most of you have probably used blockchain.info to look up transactions or see what how much money was on an address or something like that. But if you haven't, when you go there, you can just paste an address in the search bar and it will bring up a page for that address and it will show you all the transactions to and from that address. And normally, a transaction will... Most of the time, it's from one address to one address, or it might be from two or three addresses if somebody had their money kind of split up, but then all that money gets combined, and most of the time it's sent to one address if it's a normal personal transaction. I mean, some transactions might be backwards. They might be from one address to, say, 10, 20, or 50, 100 addresses, however many you want. If there's like a pool operator who wants to pay out all of his users, everyone who uses his pool, he can do that all in one transaction. He can take his money and send it to a ton of addresses all at once. And what Shared Coin does, it takes a normal transaction from one person to one person, and it combines it, and you can see all of that right on the blockchain. After you do a Shared Coin transaction, you can see... The money comes out of your address, but it goes to like eight or ten different addresses, depending on whoever was making a transaction at the same time. And one of the coolest things is that it's called repetitions. You can do these huge, complicated transactions repeatedly. So I can say I want this transaction to be mixed up, oh, I don't know, eight, ten 20 times. Now you got to pay a fee for each yeah. time. So I think the default is maybe like three. And that's probably enough, although I, I don't know any statistics or anything. But let's say you wanted to do it three times. Well, on the blockchain, you would see the address where your money was, and it would leave at that address and go to a ton of different confused addresses. And then then you have no idea what happens. You can click through any of those addresses you want, and you'll just see giant transactions from, say, 10 addresses to 10 or 12 or however many, and you can keep clicking through those addresses trying to follow your money, but it's really hard to do, and I don't even know if there technically is a path that you can call your money. I don't think that's really possible. It just all gets mixed together, and that's just how it is. But then, if you wanted to check, you could go to the receiver's address, the place where you wanted your money to end up, And you could go to that address, and you would see the money there, but it came from 8 or 10 different addresses. So yeah, that's really cool, I think. And it increases anonymity, and it's repeatable. Yeah, I mean, it worked for me. It got the money from where I wanted it to go to where... Or wait. (laughs) I got the money from where I had it to where I wanted it to go. I think I used, like, 6 transactions. It's like point zero zero five. BTC, if that does that sound right? It's half a millibit at the moment, and okay. With shared coin, you can't set your own fee. It's I'm not exactly sure why, but the fee is set for you, and you can't change it. Even though with a normal transaction, you can pay whatever fee you want. That's not possible with shared coin. Don't really know why, but yeah, at the moment it's half a millibit, which is I don't know what a quarter per repetition. One thing. And again, I don't know all of the technicalities about how this works, and I don't know how anybody malicious might be trying to analyze the blockchain, and I don't know if this is really possible. But one thing that 
that I've been thinking about a little bit and that could possibly be a problem. I don't know. But it seems like you still might be able to pull out a transaction. If you were, and obviously you would probably want a computer to do this for you, but if you were able to look at a big chunk of shared coin transactions, which you could probably identify just because they come from a ton of addresses and go to a ton of addresses, you could identify a chunk of shared coin transactions. And the main issue is that most of the time they all occur right around the same time and they're probably included all in the same block or maybe in one block in the next block. They're not spread out over time. So what you could do is take a block and this is just theoretical. Again, I don't really know if this is possible or reasonable or feasible or anything like that. You might be able to take a block and identify all of the shared coin transactions in there. And then you could look through and see like the inputs and the outputs. And say if somebody was trying to send someone half a Bitcoin. Say I wanted to send you half a Bitcoin and the default repetition was three. I, I don't remember if it is, but let's say it was three. You could look for an input that was worth exactly half a Bitcoin plus three repetitions. So it would be 0. 0.5015, I think, if the default fee was half a millibit. You could find the original input that was 0. 0.5015 and then look around through all the other shared coin transactions and see if you can find an output that was about the same value. In this case, it would be 0.5, but if you wanted to do more repetitions, you could look for one that was like 0.4995 or right around that amount. Does that make sense to you, Tim? Do you know what I'm saying? And do you think that somebody could maybe analyze things enough and see if they put things together, they could see where the input was and where the output was and see the actual transaction? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to me... It's like, yeah, I mean, I guess, because like a lot of things, I'm just like, oh, oh they can do that? Wow. <laughs> but I'm never going to be surprised, I guess, when they tell me they can do or when something else happens. I'm pretty sure I've said before about like the any of these mixing where you mix together everybody's is where if you are doing something illegal with it versus just trying to transfer money around and try to get it so that the government can't tell if you have it for like tax stuff. If it is in something where they say, like, it's for money laundering, is that instead of being like, oh, we can't tell out of these seven things, now it would have to, it would depend on how big and how much money is going through and how big of an operation it is. But if it's like, okay, these seven different people or addresses or whatever, we don't know which one is bad, but it's not like the government is that is normally where it's it's like, okay, you're innocent until proven guilty. I mean, if it gets really bad and it's a really big thing, I don't see why they wouldn't just take everyone from that, whether or not you're... I mean, that would have to be really big. I, I guess this really isn't answering your question. But. No, that's that's definitely an important point to make. Even if it was a perfect solution, or even if it worked exactly like it was supposed to, you might still only have an anonymity set of like 10 people and the government could just say, well, it's illegal to use shared coin. So therefore all 10 of you are guilty and that's something they would definitely do. So yeah, that's an important thing to think about. So yeah, I guess no matter what you do, it's not going to be perfect, but it's, it's a step in the right direction and it will help people in general, especially when you think about it. Even if somebody was able to do that sort of analysis and pull out a transaction more specifically. So yeah, you could probably figure that out. But even then, you got to do all that work and you have to identify whose addresses they are, which is a task in itself. And then even if you figure out who sent money to who, you would have to figure out, well, what was it for? Was it really for something illegal? And I mean, I know the government doesn't care about all those things and they might make assumptions and not actually prove what was or wasn't legal or what did or didn't happen, but it's still helpful and even though it's not perfect, it still is a hindrance to the government or anybody who wants to analyze the blockchain. It just increases anonymity, not perfectly, but it's helpful.
yeah, I mean, I don't think anything, we're never really going to get something that's perfect. It's just, I don't think with anything on the internet or anything in real life, you can never be completely anonymous. Nothing, complete anonymity is kind of like, I like, we should keep that as like a goal. Like, I always want people trying to work towards that and trying to get to it, but I don't think, at least for me, I don't think we're ever going to get to something where I would say, okay, now I am 100% certain that whatever I do on here cannot be traced back to me. So it's just a matter of making it as difficult as possible for them to track it to a point where it's either going to take way too long for them to do it, or it's just you're not big enough, and we just want to keep on raising that bar of what is big enough. Yeah, that makes sense. Just keep making it as difficult as possible, even though it's never going to be impossible. Just as much as you can make it difficult for them to take advantage of you or anything like that. You're listening to the You, Me, and BTC podcast. We need your help. First of all, we'd love it if you could check out our website, youmeandbtc.com. There you can find donation addresses for every single article and episode. And we'd love it if you could make use of those. We could also use some fans and followers, so if you're willing, please visit Facebook or Twitter.com slash YouMeAndBTC. Lastly, remember to subscribe to the show. You can do that on iTunes or sign up on our website to receive email updates. Thanks for your support. Yeah, I've got a few articles. Both of them are from Forbes, at least for right now. But this one is from March 5th, 2014. It's most popular Bitcoin apps soon to run on Tor Anonymity Network. It's by uh, Andy Greenberg. Bitcoin and Tor have become perhaps the two most widely used software tools for maintaining anonymity on the web. Now they're about to be stitched together, a move that would that could make a large swath of the Bitcoin network significantly stealthier. Bitcoin core developer Mike Hearn says that an upcoming version of Bitcoin J, the software that powers many of the most popular Bitcoin apps, like Multibit, Hive, and Android Wallet, will route all connections to the Bitcoin network over Tor's anonymity network. When users of those apps buy or sell Bitcoins, their transactions will be sent through Tor's system of three encrypted hops through computers around the world before they reach another Bitcoin node. So, you tell me this is right or wrong. I guess I'll say it that way, Daniel. It's saying that any kind of transactions or any connections over the network are somehow going to go right through Tor's. Because Tor has it set up so that, like, if you've never used Tor, just look up the website, T-O-R. You download the uh, Tor browser bundle that has everything in it. now, And you'll fire that up. And then if you go to something like My IP, it will not show you that you're where you are. For me, it's shown that I've been in Madrid or someplace in Eastern Europe. So it, it kind of bounces you around there. But does that, what I was saying before, Daniel, does that sound right? Yeah, I think it generally, what it would do is kind of mask where your transaction is coming from. Unfortunately, it says people who are buying or selling Bitcoins, but I don't think this is this isn't like an encrypted and anonymous Mt. Gox or anything like that. I think it just allows you to... Again, I'm not entirely sure. I could be wrong. But I think it allows your transactions to be broadcast anonymously. And what that means is you can't look at the IP address where the transaction originated and see where it came from. Now, even now, that's generally difficult to do, I think, because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. So if you receive a transaction from someone, you don't know if they're the one that initiated that transaction or if they're just relaying it. So 
Even now, it's fairly difficult to do that. But I think, again, with the right know-how and the right analysis, I think you can generally get an idea of where the transaction originated. In fact, I think maybe even on blockchain, if you click on a transaction, it might even give you an estimate of where the transaction occurred or was initiated. So I guess if you were to route that through Tor, just like you were saying with your IP address, it might say you're in Madrid, but you're not. So it's a way to gain just the same way as shared coin, you gain anonymity. And it's more difficult for people to tell where you are, who's sending money to who. Now, I do just want to say that this already was possible because when you install Tor, it actually has a proxy built into it and you can actually direct any of your services that support a SOX proxy. You can send them through Tor and Bitcoin does support those proxies. And so if you went into the settings, you could point it to your Tor proxy and all the traffic would be sent through Tor. That was possible, but I suppose this just makes it kind of easier and automatically integrated maybe. So that's pretty cool. That's actually really important, and that's something I meant to mention earlier, is the integration. That's huge, because just like the professor was saying, the average guy is not going to do this kind of work. They're not going to figure out what shared coin is, make sure they get the right amount of fees, and anything like that. I mean, I guess shared coin is a lot easier than other things, so maybe they will. Uh, maybe more people will, I guess. But not everybody, and especially not your grandmother. <laughs> so that's an important part, is this integration. It needs to be built in so that people don't even have to think about it. It's just automatically fairly anonymous. I mean, in response to the professor, I agree with you. I wish that it was all integrated now. I kind of share, I remember on a, a Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast from a while ago that Andrea is talking about Bitcoin. He's like, we need to integrate everything now and get this stuff so that just people just do it automatically. Because he said back when the internet started, it should have been like Tor from the beginning, but we let that slip through our fingers. But at the same point, the, the professor says the thing about the normal person isn't going to do this. But I mean, at least with how the world is today, the normal person isn't interested in avoiding paying for murdering people across the world this isn't a normal person issue i mean i wish it was right but the people who aren't going to be willing to do stuff just like doing shared coin that's not someone who i really think is going to be interested in avoiding paying their taxes anyway there's actually there's a part in the article talking about the ip thing it's Adding Tor into the Bitcoin apps addresses another hole in the cryptocurrency's privacy protections. Aside from the record of Bitcoin transactions stored on the blockchain, anyone capturing internet traffic could also potentially trace the source of a Bitcoin payment back to the IP address where it originated. Thanks to that IP tracking, it is, quote, possible that the NSA and GCHQ have de-anonymized most of the blockchain by now, unquote, Hearn says. Tor's trick of bouncing that connection through proxies around the world would make that sort of IP tracing surveillance much more difficult, Hearn says. Yeah, and then he they go on a little bit to talk about another thing versus just the government looking at it. And he argues that Tor also offers protection from an even more serious security problem. If a Bitcoin user connects to an untrusted Wi-Fi network, it's possible that a malicious hacker might be able to spoof the entire Bitcoin network such that the user might be tricked into thinking that he or she has been paid Bitcoins that never actually existed. So, going back to what I read before about the IP thing, you can track an IP from a Bitcoin payment. It's not that incredibly hard for someone who knows computers and someone who does that sort of thing. But using Tor, that's just adding more and more and more difficulty to it to hopefully get to a point where they're like, okay, this isn't worth the money it's going to take and the time it's going to take to do it. So, Yeah, I think especially like the NSA with all the resources they have, I'm absolutely sure that they could track things. And like Hearn was saying, maybe they already have done that and already are doing that. 
So exactly, we just need more layers. And again, it's unfortunate, but it's the same kind of deal. If the government wanted to, they could just be like, oh, well, it's illegal to use Tor. And then all of a sudden it doesn't matter that you're anonymous and just you trying to be anonymous will get you in trouble. So again, as much as we hate it, we're always at the mercy of the government and there's not a ton we can do about it except just keep pushing these ideas and these projects and concepts and software and anonymity and privacy, everything. We just need that everywhere because like you were saying, and this is unfortunate too, but the average guy, not only is he not going to try to remain anonymous, but he's not going to care. He's not going to want to remain anonymous because he doesn't care about giving money to people who are going to kill other people. And that's the kind of thing that we need to take care of. Now, it's kind of a stupid thing to say we need to make people understand this because everybody understands things perfectly in their own mind. <laughs> and no matter how hard you try, you're never going to make everybody understand anything. So it's not going to be easy. It's not really going to be straightforward. And I think it would be hard to say that you're even going to be successful in the end. But it's something that we're working on. No, yeah, I think just you want to motivate people to just be like, okay, don't you even want to just try to put some effort into your life? It's like you think of, you're like, okay, yeah, I don't do that much. I don't put that much thought into it. Because my first reaction is to do the whole, oh, well, I, I put a lot more effort into my life. I actually think about things. But then just about 99% of the internet says that. <laughs> where just like, like, well, we're not all those jocks. But now, I mean, I don't know why I use jocks, but the internet's big enough that everyone's basically on there. And now everyone somehow, just because they got on the internet, is now a deep thinker. And, oh, I'm a nerd and I'm so cool. And. Well, I don't know if it's even the internet. I think that's just generally how the mind works. And. To some extent, there's nothing wrong with that, because if you believe something, if there's something that you base your life on, then, I mean, whether you're right or wrong, you base your life on it for a reason, and you probably think you're right. And it's good to be open-minded, and yeah, I think people should be open-minded in general, but that doesn't change the fact that if you believe something, then you're going to think you're right and you're going to proclaim that and things like that. Now, you shouldn't be a jerk about it. You shouldn't be rude or anything. And you shouldn't say that other people are worse because, well, because of that exact same reason, because they think that they're right. Everything makes sense in their head. And so they're not really stupid. They just don't understand. And whatever they believe makes sense in their head somehow. So... Yeah, like I was saying before, I feel like a jerk when at first I think like, oh, well, I don't, like, I'm, oh, I'm involved in Bitcoin, I actually care about where my money goes, and then, or I'm conscious somewhat of what's going on around me and what the government's doing and what just other people are like, and then you're like, well, no, that just sounds really prideful, but then I go on the internet or I go and I talk to people in real life or you walk around things. And most people just don't care. Most people, it's, if you have a different opinion, please tell us and please tell me I'm sounding like a jerk because I don't want to sound like a jerk. Mm -hmm. This is just, like I said, my first reaction is like, oh, those people are shallow and everything. But then I'm like, well, maybe they're not shallow. And then I look at them like, maybe they are because a lot of people, they don't know they're shallow, obviously. And I'm shallow about things too that I don't know, but I, I'm not going to say what I'm shallow about because, like you're saying, it doesn't seem shallow to me. <laughs> exactly. Maybe it's like a lot of these people, and maybe it's because I don't have a family and I don't have much of a life anyway, but a lot of the people, it's, okay, what sitcom am I watching tonight? What new reality TV show is starting? I don't really like the president, mm -hmm. but he's okay. I don't really like the government. And they're all stupid, but somehow... The system still works because we get to choose every four years, but there's always that thing where people are like, well, they're all bad, but except I'm going to vote for this one because he's not too bad and he says a few things I like and he says God's name enough or he says God or he 
doesn't say God's name too much and I like that or whatever. Like the average person just doesn't care that much. They don't want to think about it. And I know saying this makes me sound like horrible. It's like I kind of wish sometimes, not that I wish, but I was thinking today, I'm like, would I want to not think about this stuff all the time and be worried about this stuff all the time and I'm like I mean it'd be nice I'd kind of just walk around I just do whatever I wouldn't really care about what we're doing in Yemen or what we're doing in Iraq or how much money is being stolen from me every day <laughs> so that that sounds incredibly high and mighty and I hope you don't take it that way but you were talking about trying to get people to take this stuff and it's kind of hard with anonymity stuff because it's harder but this comes from someone talking about libertarianism and stuff like that. And it's, I think, originally Ron Paul said that it's like, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. <laughs> and this guy was talking about, you're never going, this was Adam Kokesh, you're never going to get someone to change to your way of thinking if you're saying, hey, look, come over, join this. You can be miserable all the time. You can just whine and complain. Isn't that <laughs> great? I mean, it, it doesn't mean you want to force it to be fun, but at least, like, show people, like, how this stuff makes your life better. Like, how Bitcoin lets me not have to pay for murdering people, or how Bitcoin makes me so I don't have to pay all the different stuff that normally gets put onto any kind of legal currency. But I don't think, for any Bitcoin evangelists out there listening, or I need to remind myself of this with everything, if you're not getting enjoyment out of something, you're not going to bring anyone to this way of thinking or what you see as truth because people like incentives move people so they're not going to switch to something if it's incredibly hard and this that's why it would be great to have it integrated so that it's like okay i don't even notice that all this encryption is going on right now but yeah be happy uh, and show people why doing what you do makes could make them happy you kind of just have to make a pitch to them <laughs> Don't be always complaining. And I, out of everyone I know, I'm the probably the biggest offender there of just whining about things and making everything seem terrible. And then when you go talk to people in my family, they don't really want to talk to me too much, anyone who sees what I put on Facebook. But I've kind of tried to stop doing that as much, just getting angry about stuff. And I think everyone kind of goes through... I'm saying not because I went through it, but because I've heard it from so many other people that if you're new getting into Bitcoin or libertarianism and stuff like that, that everyone kind of goes through a really angry period where you're just miserable. And <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, it's like we have to make a pitch and then say that we enjoy it a lot. It's hard to do it that way because most pitches are lies <laughs> oh i mean i don't know if that's true but that's kind of anytime i see a commercial i generally think that a large part of it probably isn't true or they're trying to con us somehow and if it says it's going to make you lose weight it's probably not <laughs> or something like that so it's hard to say that we're going to make a pitch bitcoin is amazing that generally might put people like so you're just trying to say that so that i'll believe you or something yeah then everyone just says it's a pyramid scheme well, yeah, it is difficult, but at the same time, that that is what we believe, and we do believe it for a reason, and it does make sense to us, just like whatever you believe makes sense to you. So, I mean, it's kind of a philosophical thing that we might never completely understand, but yeah, that's what we believe, and we really do. I hope we have expressed this through the show, but we really do reap tons of enjoyment from this stuff we at least i do and i think you agree tim but we really do love it i mean if it's for political reasons if you like to not pay money to someone who's going to murder people then yeah that's amazing and that's definitely enjoyable but there's a lot more too we've learned and we talk about this a lot and it's true and it's good but we've learned all kinds of finance things economics things I've had this whole project with the website and the podcast. It's been tons of fun, and it really is an amazing space, an amazing community. There's tons of room for growth. So, yeah, I guess I am making a pitch, but it's still the truth, no matter how you put it, even if it is a pitch. To us, we really do enjoy it, and it does mean a lot, not just to make us happy, but to make the world a better place. And it, 
it's awesome. <laughs> At least in our opinion, so. Thanks for listening this week. Tune in next Thursday.